Excellent. Okay, uh, hello everyone and welcome to our second uh, part of our Biocontrol Research Masterclass series. It's a real pleasure to be back with you again and also to have Dr. Roma Gwynn with us. Um, it's always great to have her and also uh, Putra. Putra is with us as well, Ignatius Putra and Dika, our project assistant on this work. Uh, we're very happy um, to be back and for the session where we're going to look at the product development process and we're expecting lots of questions um, and we've also got some results from a short survey that I did uh, overnight which many of you answered so I was really um, excited to see that. Uh, so just moving on um, and actually before I move on I'll just, I'll just say I wanted to also have a big thank you to uh, Valent Biosciences and Sumitomo Chemical for really supporting this series for the three parts of the series but also the masterclass regulatory series that we ran in May. Uh, it's been a really big help and uh, we're really appreciative of that support. So just a reminder, so please use the chat box today to ask questions, share your thoughts, introduce yourself, uh, please also share uh, any resources that you have related to the topic uh, more broadly. Uh, we're always keen to see as many resources and information shared as possible because this is a great environment to form networks and really um, build capability amongst all of us. Uh, next uh, slide. I'm just going to remind you, and you don't really need reminding, I can see the chat box already completely uh, going full on there, but please just introduce yourself if you haven't uh, already, because it's really nice to know who is in the room. Right, moving on. Is, this is part two, as I said. Part three is actually next week. We're going to have a very rapid turnover, uh, but we're going to have a special session next week, a real masterclass session, where you're going to be asking lots of questions over the next sort of week so that we can really um, dig into all those uh, still to be clarified or the real questions that haven't been answered uh, yet in the session. Roma's going to tell you more about that later, but um, that will be next Wednesday, same time. So looking forward to seeing you there as well. Right. I asked some questions yesterday in a poll. I was actually uh, quite pleasantly surprised, uh, not really because you're all so good, but um, it was nice to see so many people answer the survey. So firstly, just to get an idea of here what is everyone working on um, so we've got quite an interesting mix here I was a little bit surprised and I was just talking to Roma about this before we started how many people were working on semia chemicals but um, Roma what's your sort of thoughts on the range here yeah this is a really interesting result because <clears throat> if you look at say you take Europe for example and look at what substances are registered you actually have the same ratio so this is really interesting all around the world the proportion of people who are working on microbials is the highest, and then botanicals, and then come senior chemicals. Um, so it's really interesting to see that this is maybe to do the technical fit. Um, so regardless of the different crops, different pests, that this is the sort of technical fit. Um, but really encouraged to see so much work on senior chemicals, because I think they're a really interesting group of substances. And there's a real potential to use these substances either as standalone or in combination so like you know you can attract your insects to uh somewhere and then you can add the biocontrol onto them and there's some hopefully there's some really nice combination um concepts and maybe that's something we should have asked are you using anything in combination yeah well we can ask that on the uh, survey coming up so let's just write that down uh Petra. <laughs> Don't forget, because it's a good question. Um, but also, I'm just going to put a big shout out because I was in Vietnam last week and I had a fantastic time. It was so nice being out, uh, out sort of in the field, but and also meeting farmers, researchers, and government people working um, enthusiastically on on fall armyworm control. And um, there was a really good researcher, uh, research project, and researcher uh, who was working on semi chemicals, was working on pheromones, and it was really exciting to see. So at another time we'll get that person in to speak because um, I'm sure she'll have some questions for you too Roma so just a big shout out there and if we move on to the next slide some more interesting uh, sort of feedback what type of biotic factor is your biopesticide for uh, we're very much in the insects realm here uh, probably mm. not surprising as well what what do you think this is slightly interesting because in other parts of the world actually 
there's probably more work done on the plant pathogens. So initially there was oh. more on insects and that was driven because of all the work on um, BTs, Bacillus thuringiensis. Yeah. Um, and so that tended to sort of look disproportionate. And again, maybe that's a question we could ask. If you're targeting an insect, is that because you're working with BT or with something else? Because it might be the BT is distorting. But in other parts of the world, it's the diseases. There's more effort gone into disease. So insects always higher, but usually the number of people working on the plant diseases is also higher than this. And absolutely for weeds, it always sits, languishes at the bottom. It's so hard to find biocontrols with potential against weeds. Oh, interesting. Okay, that's that's good. I'm glad that we asked these questions because it's good to have your feedback too, Roma. It's really it's really nice to see the comparison as well around the world. Uh, on the next slide, we asked, have you commercialized any of your research, such as sold it, incorporated part or all of it into a business or product service that's sold in the marketplace? And 94% of you said no. So uh, that is interesting. This <laughs> oh, this is my favourite slide, um, because I just think this is what this whole session is about, um, and especially today and next week, and it's really was great to see this because it. I was thinking next week, oh, we need to run a masterclass to really unlock what's stopping things moving forward, and so we can have that sort of really specific question and answering and help to see if I can solve some of people's problems so they can move forward, yep. because I think really exploring the reasons why substances aren't commercialized will be interesting i'll address some of those today i think um but then in the next session hopefully we can address uh, others as well but this so what this says to me is we're spending a lot of money on research but it's not getting through to the farmers and it's just disproportionate we need to have much more of these great ideas this innovation getting to the farmers so that it makes a difference to the farmers in the field yep uh, definitely. And, and what's interesting is the next slide, uh, Roma, because when we asked, are you interested in commercialising your research? We got 73% of you, 74, uh, if you slightly round it up, I guess, um, saying yes, you are interested. So I thought that was, um, was quite an interesting story, uh, that those two slides. Yeah, they match it. But I think what's also interesting, we shouldn't, we shouldn't miss out, is the no's and the not applicables. Yep. Because um, we're working, in, and I'll come on to this and it's sort of explore a little bit as to why we might be getting there as no's and why something's not applicable. Yep. Um, and I'll talk about that in, in today's presentation to some extent. Yep, excellent. And the next slide we asked, do you think you'd benefit from specialist product development or commercialization advice to help you develop your research for use by farmers or, or other users in the field? We got 38% saying yes early on in my research when I start a new research project. And then we got 47% saying yes later on in my research when I've finished my initial results and I'm looking at commercial applications. Uh, and then we got some that are, uh, are not applicable, but um, your thoughts on that? I think this is a long way to answering the no's we got two slides ago, because hopefully after the end of today, um, we'll see if people agree with me. And again, Putra, we'll ask this question again, because I think the people who say yes later on, that's the problem as to why it's not going to commercialisation. And that's sort of what I'm exploring in today's talk is to that feeling like I want to go away and I want to do all my own research and I know what I'm doing and then I'll come up with something brilliant and then I'll sell it. And saying, I'm going to explore saying, is that the right model? Is there another way that you can do this where you have a greater chance of being successful at moving it on and commercialising it? And um, so I like the yes early on in my, my new research because I think that's the right approach. And yes, later on, I'll see if we can change people's thinking by the end of today's session. Excellent. Good stuff. And I think, did we have one more or is that might be it? I'm not sure. No, that's, that's it. it. And that's that's actually a great start. We've got lots to think about and come back. Um, I'm just going to check the chat. And yes, everyone's just um, introducing themselves, just making sure there weren't any questions. But that's a really good start. So I'm going to hand it over to you now, uh, Roma. And um, just remember, everyone, ask your questions there is no silly question um, next week as well we'll really be having like a clinic where you can really like come and uh, ask questions um, and yeah. so think about that as well but but don't be shy because this is what we're all here for today so thanks Roman yeah. great okay thank you Alison that's it that was the survey was really interesting um, and absolutely well worth doing so yeah, thank you so much for organizing that that was good
Good. So I just want to just remind us um, and recap because not everybody might have been here for the previous session. So just as a recap. So we in crop protection, we had this sort of picture of crop protection, um, which developed in the 1950s and 60s, probably for, for most of us were born. Um, and in that we needed to feed people quickly. Um, and so what we did, we had a high input system, we had high input for, um, plant varieties, high input fertilizers, and high input pesticides. We were really successful and we managed in the world to grow lots of food. And if you look at this landscape in the picture, it's a beautiful landscape, but it's also a very changed landscape. And you start to look at it and say, where's the space for nature? Look at how much mankind has changed the landscape. And what we've slowly come to realize is that we're having, um, unintended consequences and unintended effects. Um, and these effects are causing um, unacceptable harm to humans to, and to our environment. And we've, we're at a point where we, we want to change this. We want to do something different. And this is where biocontrol is coming. But if we think about, we still have to feed the population. So I find this startling that in my lifetime, the world population has doubled. That's just in my lifetime but the amount of farmable land hasn't increased. So what that means is that the land that we farm has to become more productive. And there's a tension to saying, well, we can't do that without um, chemical, conventional chemical pesticides. And what I'm saying was, actually, maybe that's not true. Maybe we can take a different approach. And that's why we're exploring using these biocontrol technologies. The problem we're always gonna have is when we're growing food, we're growing a monoculture. And as biologists and ecologists, we know that um, the food that, a monoculture system is inherently unstable. So what we're trying to do with this sort of new ideas about crop protection is to grow monocultures, but make it more stable. How can we make it more stable? We can make it more stable by having sort of a, a varietal mixes. We can make it more stable by enriching the biocontrols that are in environment. We can make it more, more stable by thinking about rotations and other crops there. Um, and this work is, is going on at the moment. And a sort of main stem of that again is biocontrol. So this is why I sort of think, well, we've got this crop protection model. And if we look at FAO figures, we're still losing 30 or 40% of the crops before harvest. Um, so the model we've got hasn't been working and we're causing unacceptable harm. So we kind of have to make a change and we need best practice. And this is where biocontrol comes in. Biocontrol is part of this best practice. And what we're seeing increasingly around the world is gonna become the mainstay. It's gonna be the main element of crop protection. How far, how quickly we get to that point is different around different parts of the world, but it, everybody's traveling in the same direction now. So just a little bit of a recap about the technologies I'm talking about. When we talk about bioprotectants or biological technologies or biocontrol solutions, we mean these four, four categories. But what we're talking about in terms of the commercial development and in this series of talks is we're, we're focusing on microorganisms, the botanical and natural substances and the senior chemicals. So just a little recap, we've we'll talked about microorganisms. Uh, there's a whole range of different species that are used. Um, the species can sometimes change their name, which is why you have to pay attention to the strain that you're working with and be really careful and always track and work, work and name the strain. So when you isolate something, name that strain and make sure you, you know, if it's number one, call it one, then two, then three, but be really clear about what strain because you can have big differences between strains of the same species. We know that the micro, we've got microbial biofungicides um, and these can be working against, um, you've got fungi against fungi and fungi against bacteria and bacteria against fungi, etc. So very few viruses in this plant uh, for plant diseases then. Then you have uh, microbial insecticides. So again, you've got fungi, um, but you also have um, bacteria and you also do have viruses as well so this is where it's slightly different what's important about these different types of microorganisms is to think as a researcher think about what's the route of entry into the insect because that's a really critical part of building your research plan um, is it something the insect has to eat or is it something that is um, incidental when we're thinking about the fungi the fungi, they, they're, they're not moving whereas you've got an insect that moves but for diseases they're not moving so you've got a difference there and as you think about your research, you should think about that. And then we've got the natural substance, which is botanicals or plant extracts. Um, and these are just some of the plants which have been used to obtain extracts, which are used in crop protection. And they're used as 
uh, against diseases, against insects and against nematodes. And then we have the pheromones or xenochemicals. And essentially these are substances produced by one organism to affect the behavior of other members of that same group. So the best known ones are the straight chain lepidopteran pheromones. These are mating pheromones. So for example, um, you synthesize and make a pheromone, which is the same as the female pheromone. Um, and then you have a plume of this pheromone across a field and the males can't find the females, they can't mate, you don't get next generation. And by that means you, um, manage the pest population. And these are interesting because these substances don't actually kill anything. They change the behavior of um, an organism. And that's quite different from the other um, microorganisms and the botanicals. So that's where I was in terms of a recap and in terms of sort of bringing us up to speed. And we, we talked more in more detail in the last session about all of those technologies. So I want to sort of now start to explore um, as researchers, what do we do and, and how do we work? Well, something we know about research and development is it's exceedingly knowledge intensive. Um, and that's one of the reasons why as researchers, this makes it interesting. It's really, it makes it exciting because there's just so much to learn and to understand, but it's also what makes it so complicated. And it makes it, it our, our, the work we're trying to do much more complex. And I talked last time and sort of saying, um, you know, if you're thinking about the product development pathway, um, if you're a researcher, you tend to, fo you'll follow a pathway like this. Um, so you will go and look for a, a, a microorganism, you'll look for a botanical, um, you'll then do some screens in the lab, I've called them petri dish screens, but you know, you're, you're maybe looking in little assay containers, you want to say, do these substances I have work? And you're, you're working with a small amount because you, you haven't got much, it's hard to work with. And then you, once you've looked at that screen and you maybe sort of looked at a different range of environmental conditions or temperatures at which it works over, then you'll sort of say, okay, I'll see if I can do a small pop test. And, and maybe that pop test, I'll find out what the dose is, what dose I should use. And if you look at the timelines, you're now sort of um, about three years into your project. And then mo most projects, especially if you're doing a PhD, that's sort of where your PhD finishes because you've got three years worth of money um, or if it's a fun, government funded pro project that, that's some, you run out of money and then you have to check leave your job or you have to um, move on to another contract or something and all your lovely research doesn't go anywhere and I think we saw that reflected in the survey is that um, the number of people who said no it, it's not being commercially developed and I suspect that's what's happening so just to say if I'm saying things that you think are good, that you agree with, just put a little thumbs up and agree so that we can have that shared knowledge of, do you, am I right here? Is this what's happening? Is are most people having to stop at the point where they've got that small pop test or dose rate? So I'm gonna pause a little bit and just see if, and how people think. You can put thumbs down if I'm wrong as well. Um, but is this, what's, is this what's happening? Yeah, this is kind of, so I'm going to ask you all another question. So how many of you, were, when you started to work in research, how many of you were employed to work on a research contract and somebody else had decided what you were going to work on? And how, so is that the case is that most of you applied for a PhD and you worked with a professor who then said, okay, this is, this is the research project that you'll work on. So let's just pause and see if we get any reactions there. Am I right or am I wrong? Can you put the down arrows, down thumbs if I'm wrong? Actually, there's, there's no down thumb. Actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bit hard. Thanks, Ruth. I was thinking if it's not true, maybe we could just put the, the laughter reaction on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just like, oh, rubbish. Like so if, if it is true. If it is true, thumbs up. If it's not true, you can put on that reaction with the with the laugh. Oh, not true. Oh, that's could, good. That's or it could be true. tears. Oh, somebody said somebody else is joining me. So, um, <laughs> uh, and also you can put your your comment. You can put it in the comment box too. Um, but I'm I'm interested around um, as well, uh, Roma um, and people. Mm. Is the average time of your projects? Is it around three years? three to four years does is are most people their their research projects 
three years or less is and I'd be interested if anyone has um, longer projects. And I think actually maybe that's a question we can ask in a survey. Let's, yep. let's ask what, what, how long that time is. Um, but the poetry, you don't mind taking a note of that. So share, so not, share your views in the chat too, people. So Yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, oh, I can see no thumbs up. Yeah, okay. Um, were there any questions we needed to address just now, Alison? No, no, that's good. Okay, great. Yeah, so and then um, if you're lucky and you've got some more money, you're able to go on and do the next part, which is actually take that idea from the laboratory and move it into a small field um, experiment or a small greenhouse experiment. And then that, a lot of the time, people are looking at something like um, perhaps starting to look at the effect of... Um, timing of the dose and the effect of the timing of the application relative to the target disease or looking at the effect of the um your your research or a control agent um in terms of the amount of disease as well and then if you're lucky you've gone on to do some more sort of small scale tests or some at least a field trial or something and all of that is taking about four and a half years um, and most people have kind of moved on, finished the PhD, money's run out, and that's where it stops. And again, I think that's probably why we see that um, that bit higher score know that they haven't commercialized. But just so I want to Ryan, yeah. just a quick, I'm just gonna um, jump in. But we did have a good comment here actually um, mm. from JL10. And I, I do wonder about this too, and that particularly when you're first starting out research, and I'm just thinking of when you do your doctorate and you sort of do three years. And um, it can be quite a long time, three years, mm -hmm. <laughs> doing research. Uh, and sometimes it can get, you can feel a bit discouraged. And by the end of three years, it feels a bit of a slog. And maybe your field trials weren't, uh, you can't quite work out what's happening. Um, and, and somebody's just here put in, I think, passion to pursue further is also important because a lot of people get discouraged in field trials because often mm. field trials yield different results. There are many parameters to consider. And I noted many projects just end with discouraging outcomes instead of putting effort to find out the other factors and try to find the benefits and synergies. Do you think, I think that could be play a little part as well, maybe around the yeah. three year type think, getting discouraged and thinking maybe I should move yeah. on to something else? No, I think um, what I would like to say, and hopefully, um, who's, whoever's written that can reflect on this at the end of the talk. I'm going to say, um, I understand people getting discouraged. And what I'm trying to talk about today is things that you can do to be more successful in your research. Yeah. And perfect. so then hopefully people are not going to get discouraged. Um, and I'm going to propose different ways. So, this, what I've outlined here, is what most people do. Yep. What I'm going to talk on from now on is could we do something different and what does that different look like and in my experience by doing something different we make greater progress um, but it does require a different approach so this is what commercial companies do completely different it's not that linear system it's a matrix system now for anybody panics and saying there's no way I can do all of this of course not but what I want to sort of say is what is to think about your um, active substance, think about the research you're doing, and think about the research in the context of this, this map and this, this matrix system, and think about when I'm working in my research, which part of this process am I coming in at, and what am I doing? Now, I expect most people are gonna come in here, active substance acquisition, and that could be by a survey or your laboratory already has a, a culture collection that you're working with, and then you're going to screen it. But what I'd like to explore is saying that maybe where you've got to come in, but before you start doing any work, there's some things you can do first. And what those things are is market assessment. So when we're working by control, um, by control is um, an apply, most of us are working for an applied end. We're trying to develop something or we want, we're involved in it because we're looking at something that will eventually get into the hands of the farmers. We saw in the survey that some people said, no, they don't want to commercialize it or no, it's not applicable. So there are sometimes research going on, which isn't about commercializing. It's about that very pure science, which is blue sky research. 
and it's not intended to find a solution for farmers, but maybe intended to find more about, say, a system or a symbiotic relationship or the more intimate mechanisms by which an insect and pathogen may work. Um, and so they're exploring a very particular part of biocontrol. But the research in itself isn't going to lead to commercialization. What it does do is that knowledge underpins this whole area. So for those people, then, of course, market research isn't applicable because you're working that pure way. But I think most people, judging by the number of yeses who want to commercialise, most people are interested in, in working on something they're getting into the hands of the farmers. So if you're going to do that, the first thing you have to do is market assess. And what do I mean by this? Um, so we have the assumption that we're working in applied science and we're trying to um, find a solution for farmers. But how do we find out what the farmer needs? What are the mechanisms we can use to find this out? And this is what I mean by market assessment. So we know that the global market's increasing, so we know that we want to work in biocontrol. But don't forget that the point at which we're working in biocontrol, we've made a lots and lots of assumptions that biocontrol is a technology that has got space in the market that's going to move forward. And that's a true assumption, but it's just a case of something where we should just check that we're working with something which is going to be acceptable into the marketplace. And then we have to sort of think, okay, we, what, what's that globally, what's going on? So it's not just about what's happening in my country, in my crop or whatever. I think it's always wise to have a context of what you're doing and how that sits in the rest of the world. So we um, had a look at, so this is a look at the value of the crop protection market. Um, and you can see, for example, that herbicides is the highest value and it's got the highest market share. And yet when we looked at the biocontrol research, there's very little going on in weeds. Now that's for a whole part of technical reasons, but what's good is for us to sort of just think and understand why there isn't more research going on in herbicides when it looks like herbicides are what a lot of the farmers need. So it's just sort of reflecting back what's going on more widely. But it also is a kind of thought like, well, if I do work on a herbicide and I find a bioherbicide that's really good, there's a big market space for it. Lots of people are going to be interested in it. That said, it's really tough to do in biocontrol. So it's just kind of having that context. And that's not just a context in terms of the technologies against pests, weeds or diseases but it's in terms of the world and sort of saying, who's mo using most of these crop protection technologies? Where are they most getting used? And I think you, as you, you can see from this, um, the Asia Pacific region is one of the biggest users of crop protection products. So you're sitting in a part of the world where the growers want solutions. They want um, insects or insect active substances. They want things to manage the diseases, they want things to manage the weeds. And in other parts of the world, it's a different balance. Um, so you're sitting, which means that you've got quite a strong market pull through. There's gonna be a lot of commercial interest, so understand the context. So when you start to work on something, I know it sounds peculiar what I'm saying, but you really sort of need to understand the context of what you're trying to develop, what you're trying to work on um, in terms of, um, global area for crop protection, but also then coming down and sort of saying, okay, if I'm going to work on something, so I know that there's a need um, for a solution against this insect or a solution against this disease. So you need to go away and, and sort of say, what are the problem pests? What are the problem diseases? So this is why would a farmer want to use this product that I'm thinking to develop? Does he really have a problem? Because I've, quite often I've seen research done on something and it's beautiful, beautiful research, but it's not something that's a real problem for the farmer. So although you may want to commercialize it, you may have done a lot of really great work, but if there isn't a market space for that, no, no commercial company's gonna pick it up because it's just the cost of developing it isn't matched by the size of the market. If the market size is too small to get enough revenue to cover those research costs, then, the, then it'll never get into the marketplace. So that's the other thing is to think about why would the farmer use the product? Now, it may be that there's certain niche um, uses against certain crops and against certain diseases. Um, but before you even start doing any research, I really encourage you to sort of just stop and just think about this. Think what is the problem that the farmer has? What is the problem I'm trying to solve? And that should help with some of the sort of demoralization because you've got a really clear focus of why what you're doing is going to be useful. 
again, I'm not, there's always serendipitous research. There's always pure research as well. But again, I think it's it's worth us just pausing and thinking it's because I quite often see pro projects done. Um, so for example, I mean, here in Europe, I see projects done on strips, mites, white flies, powdery mildew, botrytis, all the time, all the time. And you sit and look around thinking, actually there's 20 products already available for the farmers. What is it that I'm developing that's going to be different from those? And if you're not able to think, able to think about something that's going to be different, are you developing the right thing? Should you be looking at other targets? Um, and then start to explore saying, has research not been done on those other targets because it's impossible? Has it not been done because there's not a commercial space for it? Or is it just no one's paid attention to it? So again, it's just taking a moment to think this through carefully before you start research. And this really helps with giving the context and really helps with that sort of very clear rationalization about why you're doing the project and what, 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 it's, what it's for. So just anyone got any questions on that part and, and whether they agree with that or disagree with it, or has anyone done that? Um, are there any comments in the chat, Alison? Yeah, there are um, a few comments. Um, so I think here, yeah, and, and that was great. I, I, I'm always interested in um, those examples that you've got too, Roma, of like where, where you do see research and you sort of think, well, yeah, if there's already 20 products, as you say, in the marketplace, it, it would have would be good to sort of maybe have thought about that a little bit more carefully maybe before running off and doing a project. Because um, mm. as you say, it, it's demoralizing as well. If you get to the end and you've got your results and then you realize that actually it's not really needed or it's not really able to be commercialized. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or no one's going to take it up because they say, yeah, because this is, oh, well, look. Like, there's 20 products that do the same thing. Exactly. And, think, and it could be yeah. great research. It's not a reflection on the level or the quality of the research, but um, it's just that that's the reality of the situation in the marketplace. Um, yeah. Here, we've just got a few comments around, in my opinion, we must understand we're working with living things and should not work with a, the same approach like chemicals. So I think you're definitely yeah. a believer in that. Agreed. Yep. Uh, here, product development is a painful process, but product commercialization, especially product registration to a country, is a much more difficult journey. Uh, that could be an interesting um, thing to discuss. So at which stage of product yep. development should the product commercialization process start to be considered? Well, that's what this whole session is about. Exactly. <laughs> this is I can answer those at the end. <laughs> and you've already started. We've just got a bit of a, a an entree there into the into that sort of answering that question uh, just in the last sort of five minutes. Um, here is maybe projects also need to consider farmers' acceptance level. Some farmers I encounter were just too afraid to take the first steps to even try and give products a chance. Now that, that's, that's an interesting a really one. Interesting one. Yeah, now, I, I, and that's, yeah, I'd like to explore that a little bit because yep. um, we're, when you're working with, with a fairly new technology, which is what biocontrol is seen as, although it's, I've been working on it for nearly 40 years, it's not that new, but it is sort of new to some farmers. And that thing about farmers acceptance, what I've found is we have a lot of dialogue about farmers won't accept it, farmers don't want to use the technology, they don't change. And I have invariably found none of that to be true when it comes down to it. Now, with the right knowledge and the reasons for change and that good exchange, farmers moved. And sometimes I'm really even surprised. I've got farmers coming to me and saying, I'd really, why haven't you got something for this? Or it doesn't work. Or I want to move into my control. So what we have at the moment is we've got to change from that old crop protection system to a new crop protection system. That change requires a lot of knowledge exchange and a yep. lot of support to farmers to help them to make that transition. But I think when you explore with farmers and you support them, you don't find that same resistance. There's always examples of one or two, but what I find is you've got those early adopters who are really keen to develop new technology, and you've got some people who you'll never change. And yep. then of course, you know, use the ones who, who are being successful, use them to lead the field, use them to um, exemplify and to talk to so farmers, talk to farmers. And yep. if there's a farmer doing something really good, others will start to copy. Um, yep. And I think, but we have to communicate this new technology to them really well. 
Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, behaviour change doesn't just happen just because you give handover farmers a product and, and they don't just pick it yeah. up and go with it. Uh, but I find farmers usually quite thirsty for knowledge and quite interested yeah. about things. So it's about curiosity and kind of um, really providing the education and support to go with change. Uh, and making yeah. it accessible. So it has to be accessible. So it has to be um, something that they can get access to and actually afford and actually be able to use. But I'd hate yeah, to see I'd hate to see research not being done because farmers might not take it up. I think part of the yeah. research project should look at maybe those issues around how do you drive yeah, uptake. Yep. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's something to be considered. Before I go to the question, I yep. just sort of answer that. But so yeah, so I think that there is that uptake issue. Um, but I think we also need to understand we talked about in the first session efficacy and sort of saying the levels of effect might not be the same. And that's a key part of that education process, is sort of understanding that you won't see lots of dead insects, maybe, yep. but you suddenly don't have any damage. And it's that's part of that education process of explaining that biocontrol works in a different way um, and that you're working much more um, to find a balance between your pests and diseases and get a good quality crop with a good yield. Yep, no, yeah, very good. No, all good, all good points. And um, I think we'll leave the other comments for now, but they're all very good. They're all around the same area around farmers' acceptance and how do we break the habit. Um, but that is a, that we've got another topic coming up later in the year around farmer communication and behaviour change. Perfect. Um, but really, really important questions. Keep keep coming, keep the comments coming in uh, as well, people. So it's, it's great to see. Okay, Roma, over yeah. to you. Yeah, so what we're saying then is, is understanding the context in which you're working as a researcher, because sometimes, um, you know, you jump straight into a project. So just pause, just think about the context you're working in, and then pause again and think a, a lot about the, the pest target and understand as much as you can about that pest or disease. Um, and understand as much as you can about the crop on which it's going into. And also try and understand about the agronomy of how that crop's grown and what farmer practice is so that you really understand the context of where something that you're working on could be used and the ways in which it could be used. Um, and then sort of think about um, if you're developing something and you've thought about that pest or disease, if you want to manage that pest or disease, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to kill the target or are you trying to have an effect that, that improves the quality of the pro product as well? So sorry the quality of the crop so just again thinking about what is the solution that the farmers need what what is it that i would need this biocontrol agent to do but also think about things like um what's what's the host specificity because you know um do i do i want to be careful that i'm not wiping out the be beneficial insects or that the insects that are um are not causing problem for the, for the farmer um how might that product be used do i expect it to be used in ipm program and i think all crop protection going forward is in an integrated pest management program so it's how do i use my biocontrol um, within the ipm program where would it fit do i think that i'm going to try and develop a product that is for resistance management and um, what would that be so if it's for resistance management what characteristics does it need to have so probably it needs to have a different mode of action or it needs to have multiple modes of action and then if we're thinking about something we think actually this farmer he needs to control this pest, but he'll have a real, he has a real problem with residues. So it's maybe a, a crop like tomatoes, which isn't washed, it's just eaten straight away. So you don't want to have residues left on that. And then you sort of think, okay, so, so it's gonna be really useful for him to have a biocontrol agent that he can use to, towards the end of his crop cycle at harvest. And so what characteristics should the substance I'm working on have? And it, you maybe don't want something that would contribute to residues. And also think about um, the grower and how he manages his crop and when he would put the product in. So these are sometimes exercises which are you can do at your desk and it's just a good think through, but it's always good to go and meet with farmers. I learn so much from going to talk to farmers. So farmers are really great at observing what happens. They're sometimes not so good at interpreting what they're seeing but they're very, very good at seeing what's happening. And if you listen to farmers, you can learn so much from them. And that gives you the context for the research project. And this, somebody said at the beginning, it can be demoralizing. This step can make a massive difference to how your project then progresses. It makes a big difference as to how you decide what research you'll do, what experiments you'll do, and what are the 
what you're doing is you're working out what are the key and most important things to do. So what we tend to do in research is we tend to think about um, what's the best options. Now, actually, a farmer isn't interested in when something the best for something to work because he can't control the perfect humidity, the perfect weather, the perfect thing. But what he is very interested in is when something doesn't work. So it's really good for him to know, say, that a biocontrol agent doesn't work when the temperature's at this level, or it doesn't work when the UV incidence at this level. And as researchers, experimentally, you can find that out. That's really nice work to do. So it's, again, it's thinking, it's changing how we think as researchers, how we're trained. We're trained to always find the best, but actually maybe we're trying to find what's what stops this substance working not what makes it work best and that's a really different way to design your experiments and design your thinking and that step in itself saves a lot of time and effort and really directs the research program i do this commercially and i know that that's what makes me more successful at fast tracking and moving something through by understanding that and then the other thing we do as researchers is we want to we always want to do something by the simplest point. And I think it's taking a moment to say that biocontrols isn't simple. It has multiple modes of action. It has multiple interactions and we perhaps can't make it simple. So what we have to do is design experiments and think about things, dealing with things that are complex. And this then comes down to a different, building your research program in a different way. It's designing your experiments in a different way. Um, and it's really good to go and talk to a statistician and say, I'm about to work with something and I know I'll have a 50% variance. So how should I design my experiment? I was lucky enough to do that when I started my research. I was at an institute which had a really great stats department and I worked with somebody who was really good at explaining complicated statistics to me. And together we worked on coming up with good experimental design. Um, and what I was trying to do, to do is to reduce times when my experiments didn't work. Um, and he helped me by doing that by understanding how many replicates I needed to use, how I designed my experiment and understanding where my key variables were and how to manage that. And that's another step that really, really will help to give you less failed experiments and have more, more experiments. Good, okay. So just finishing up with the, the market assessment and thinking about what it, the context in which we're working, what does the farmer need and what do I need to do as a researcher in terms of my experimental work? So we, we have an assumption that we're working in applied fields of biocontrol. Um, and how can we find out what the farmer needs? Well, we can find statistics on the crops that grow. So what are the main crops? We can work with agronomists to understand the pest status. Um, the statistics from people like FAO, we can do a literature review. We, another thing you could do is at the beginning of your work is you could do a survey of the farmers. You could ask the farmers what are their main problems. And then you can ask the farmers what they use and maybe sort of say to the farmers, what, what do they think about using a biocontrol? Um, and so really what I'd encourage is to, to build that contact with the end use place where the product will be used and to listen to what farmers are saying, and what farmers need. Um, before I move on to the next section, was there any um, questions then? Uh, no, but I, I just really, I'm just going to emphasise that last point you made around building contact with the end user from the very start. I mean, I think that's really useful advice, actually, getting out there in the field and actually, because once you have that relationship, you can build on that relationship and use it um, right through your research to sort of yeah. give yourself a reality check every so often as well. You know, am yeah. I am I still doing something that's going to meet this, these farmers' needs? Is it still going to be useful? And, and understanding if they're changing their behaviour in the field or are they needing new products or what's actually happening um, is quite useful mm -hmm. as well. So you don't get to the end of your project four years later and realise that they've moved on um, <laughs> without yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it, 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 it's, it's a two way process. So it's, it's listening to the farmers, but you then have to be a good scientist and think, OK, some of the things the farmers are saying are a little bit crazy, um, but just sort yep. of understanding the problems they have um, to grow the crops. Yep, excellent. Thanks, Rana. OK, so um, just then going back into this plan. So what we've covered is this area. This is the market assessment. We've looked at it. So what I'm saying is instead of starting at point three and jumping to lab screen, pause and think about that market market assessment and just think, okay, 
what what am I doing? Where do I where do I place the product? Then for me, the, the next part that I do then is I think about my product development plan. So I just pause a little bit and think, what am I going to do? So I've learned all this information about what the farmer's problems are. I've learned all this information about the pest or disease or weed. Um, I have an understanding of its life cycle. I have an understanding of where a biocontrol might be the best place to use it. So what do I do next? And then I just pause and think, okay, I've only got three years worth of money. So what, are, what can I do in those three years? I might not be able to do everything. So I just sit down and think is what's my product development plan? And I pause and think about that. So I'm just gonna explore a little bit about that. So what I do is just then sort of think is what steps will I follow in the project? What am I gonna plan? It's like, it's like doing a business plan. Um, it's just sort of saying, what am I planning to do? Because sometimes we just jump in and we do experiments and we don't do experiments that we think about first. We think oh, I can design a nice experiment, but I think what we should be doing think is what's the questions we want to ask first. We can always design nice experiments, but we are sometimes really poor at thinking, what is the question that I'm asking? What am I trying to answer? And this is what a product development plan does. It stops you doing an experiment and says, what is the problem that I'm trying to solve? What's the question I'm asking? And then what's the experiment I designed to answer that question? And that's really important. And you can do that um, by sort of saying, well, how, how long's the project? How much research money have I got? Have I got a seasonal pest? So actually I'm only gonna get one chance a year to work with it. Can I work in the laboratory? Um, where do I get my pest or disease from? Is it really available? So ask yourself these questions so that you can then start to develop a realistic product development plan of what can be achieved in the time. So it may be better to do something small and do it really, really well than try and do too much. So think very clearly and say, what's the question I want to ask? So is the question I want to ask is I need to know how this insect's killed by pathogens or do I need to know what temperature does this um, plant, this microorganism stop working in? Or I need to understand um, what happens when I've got high population. So all these questions then will lead you to developing a really good null hypothesis and saying, what is the question I'm asking? And then after that, you design the experiment to answer the question you're asking. So, so often I see people develop an experiment and then afterwards sort of say, look at data and say, well, I'm not sure what happened and say, well, what was the question you were asking? Um, and they've just designed a really good experiment that's been done really well, taken a lot of time and effort, but they weren't sure of the question they're asking. So one of the things I do to make it go faster is be really clear about the questions I'm asking. I'm really clear about how much money I've got. Um, I'm really clear about how long I think the experiments will take so that I use the money and time I have available in a very smart way to think about my experimental design. Um, and so really my message here is to match the resources, to be realistic about what can be achieved with the time you have available. There's nothing more demoralizing than having an over ambitious target and not any, getting anywhere near that and you've run out of money. So it's just that going back to thinking about this is how much time and money, what can I realistically do? Because you know if you've got a pest that's growing all the time, you can work with it all year, but it's only growing, uh, for one part of the year, then you've got one opportunity in that whole year to work with it. Um, and that's that's a different kind of experiment. So that's what I was gonna say, say on that planning, but it's a very short slide, but it, what I can see is the researchers who spend time doing that are usually more successful than the researchers who don't do time doing that. So I really encourage that. So has anyone got any comments? Just, I mean, what I'd really like to know is, is do, do people do that? Do you, are you already doing this? So any sort of thumbs up if you if this is something you're already doing? Find those little buttons. Okay. Okay, good. Um, it's really nice that like some of you are already doing this. And let's hear from the people who aren't doing it. It's completely anonymous. So do those laughing faces if you know if you never do this. Or you've you've had you, the way your the research project was developed, you didn't have an opportunity to take time to do this. I'll, 
I'm kind of, I'm going to be kind of honest because I know I didn't do that. And I know that was one of the things that used to slow me down was making progress because I wasn't good enough about doing that step. Um, so it was when I learned to be good about doing that step, I was able to make my research go faster. And certainly from a commercial point standpoint, that's absolutely what happens. That first part of the phase is really the rigorous part of the phase. And you'll see I've got dotted lines on here. And those dotted lines represent when in a commercial situation, a company will stop a project. So I have been working for commercial companies and they've stopped the project after one and two because they said, yeah, there's no point going there. It's, we're not working on that technology, move on to another technology. Um, so again, it's been very rigorous about when to stop doing something as well as when to do something. Okay, so what I want to move on to now is the point three, the active substance acquisition, which is, I suspect, the point at which many of you have come into your research projects. So the first thing is, what is the active substance and where is it obtained from? So one of the things I often see, and um, I think, yeah, if I'm honest, I think some professors need to be think about this. So when somebody comes in to do a PhD or to do a piece of research, the thing, first thing they're told to do is go away and do a survey, um, and go and sample soils or go and find the insect, etc. cetera. Um, and I, first thing I'm saying, why? Why did you do that? Because maybe there's a solution commercially available already that you can access. So is there a company out there who's already got a biocontrol agent that they're selling against the target? Maybe think about going to work with them and say, helping them to find out more about that microbial strain. Um, and by helping them to find out more about the microbial strain, you can do some really beautiful research and you'll get your PhD and it's a really lovely project. Um, and the commercial company will be engaged in that because you're helping them to understand what they've got and you're helping them to understand how to make their, their product work better. Because the truth is a lot of these technologies, they move through that commercial system so fast that what you tend to ask, or what I describe is the first thing you ask is, does it work? The second question you ask is, how does it work? So quite often products have got into the commercial marketplace and saying, does it work? The answer is yes. But they haven't, they don't understand yet enough about how it works. So maybe in a research project, you can engage with a, a commercial company to do that and you get beautiful research out of it, but you're also benefiting um, that commercial company and that, that the farmer because you're getting products that work better. Um, and that solution might be something that's not necessarily available in, in your country. It might be available in, in an another country and you look across and say oh, okay they've got a product that's really good against this disease on that crop I wonder if I could um, get samples of that and work with it and I know when I work with commercial companies I we were really willing to give out samples of pure cultures to researchers so they could work on these substances and what you then end up is, is building the body of knowledge um, about those products those, pro those products then work better and you've got better information to the farmers it sometimes feels like, well, it's not mine and I didn't invent it, etc. But if you can step aside from those that thinking, what you then can do is you can develop some really good underpinning research and understanding. And I've got to say, this is something that is absolutely lacking in the biocontrol sector is researchers who will do some of that really lovely underpinning science to really understand more about microorganisms. And most companies will work and support you in that work as, as well. So it's a, a just, it's a different approach to what you may be thinking about, where you're going to go and find your own substance. Um, but the first question I always ask, so I sit in research meetings and I see paper after paper where the scientist says, I went and found a new isolate. The, that's um, expensive. It will, it takes sort of five, 10, to 20 million pounds to develop a new product. That's why a lot of stuff's not being commercialized. It's because people are coming up with something that's the same as something that's already, but it's got to be kind of 20 million pounds better before a commercial company is going to pick up on it as well. I know this is kind of hard information, but this is how to unlock this area in biocontrol and how to start to have access to do some really interesting research. So look at, the first thing I do is look at whether there's something else available there. 
it's good practice to do that just so you can see what the competitive landscape is but it also is saying do I need to go out and find a new strain or is there something out there that's pretty good and I can work with that company and make it very good. So, um, and then the other thing is looking at the research that's already designed, uh, sorry, the research that's already been done so that you can find something that um, is already being assessed. And it's only when you've done all of that part and there isn't a solution that you can then say, ah, perhaps I need to go and look for an active substance. It's going to be slower in your research and it's going to be more expensive to do that. And then when you start to go and look for an active substance, there's ways of doing that. There's ways of going to, you don't need to go out into the fields and search for it yourself. That might be the right answer, but it may not be the right answer. Also think about looking at tissue culture collections. Has your colleague done it in another research facility in another country? Have they done that survey work already? They got to that three years and then their research money finished and they could go no further. And there's this lovely tissue culture collection sitting there that you could go and work on and then you can take out that first part of the work which will take you six months to a year to do and you that means you've saved yourself six months or a year on your research project and you can really jump forward so again it's matching resources and be realistic about what steps can be achieved um, and it's there's no compromise in research to starting to work with something that's already commercially available Alison um, any questions come through no, but I, I was really interested in that idea of working with companies like like you suggested. Um, and also that you, you're saying that companies are actually quite open to that as mm. well. I, I mean, I think that's yeah. quite a quite a useful um, avenue to explore. And I was just asking if anyone is doing that. Um, uh, and Ruth just said, yes, it's really helpful. And I'd be really interested if anyone um, else has experience um, or would be interested uh, and doing that too, because it's something that you don't always think about, you, you know, as you're setting up your research. So really, really good hunt and really good, um, yeah. good, good idea there, Roma. Yeah. So most most researchers, um, it's very rare for a company to buy a technology from a research project. It's really, really rare. If you look at the amount of research that goes on, and you look at the amount of products in the market, it's obvious that a lot of that research is never getting commercialized. Um, so can you do something be smarter than that and say, actually, why don't I work with this company? I think they're a really good company. They probably haven't got enough money to do good research and development. So I can maybe work alongside them in partnership to, to, to do some really good research that helps them underpin what they've got. And that's a really good approach to take. Because there's all this, I start with the simplest questions and you end up with the most complicated pieces of research, research because it's never as simple as you think it's going to be. So I always try and ask a really simple question. Okay, so that's about the active substance acquisition. And what I said in, in when I was talking was sort of saying, okay, if somebody's going to develop something, it's taking millions of dollars to develop that substance. I just want to really emphasize this and say, if you develop your own isolate, it has got to be several million dollars better than something that's already in the marketplace. Or it has got to be highly effective. It's got to open up a market that, the, that somebody's not getting with the product that they've already developed, or they will not invest. It just can't afford to invest. The numbers don't add up because it takes so long to do the R&D work. It takes so long to do the right um, formulation, mass production, etc. Um, you If somebody comes to you and says, oh, I've got a new isolate that does this, or I've got a new botanical that does this, it needs to be a lot better than the marketplace. It needs to be a lot, uh, much better safety profile, or it must have, it has some attribute that makes it different, or it will never get invested in. And again, that's probably part of this sort of being a bit demoralized is because you've got to find something that's really good before it gets invested in. And that's why I say, think about working with things that are already available um, and finding out good knowledge and building that knowledge and putting it into the public domain. And that helps everybody. So these, these are the figures um, I take. These are average figures for developing a new biocontroller. So they're kind of scary figures. So for a commercial company to invest, it's a lot of money. So then what we've looked at in this sort of very complex system is we've 
I thought about market assessment and thought, yep, okay, there's a real need. The prop farmer has a problem. And I've looked at my product development plan and said, right, I've got three years, so I'm going to have to kind of do this. I've gone and found, found an active substance to work with and whether I've got it from a commercial company or whether I've I actually had to go out and look at it. The next thing I need to find out is kind of, you know, does it work? Does it do anything? So let's go and look at that. Oh, sorry. Before we get onto that, something that I put as a priority is assess safety. I never want somebody working on something which causes any issues in terms of their, their safety. We really have to think about worker safety. So one of the questions I ask myself at an early stage is, are there any safety issues for the active substance or product? So thinking about this for microorganisms, really be sure right at the beginning that you're not working with a human pathogen because you kind of don't want to cause yourself any harm or to cause any bit of harm. And the other thing that you need to work make sure is you absolutely have a pure culture that you've got no contaminants in there that there's nothing in there except you absolutely know what's in there so which means that you have to identify what you've got at a very very early stage and I do that for safety so I so often see somebody who said oh I isolated this from an insect and it's an insect pathogen and I'm saying is you really sure have you really identified it have you done that identity to be certain that you're not working on some human pathogen so really think about that think about your safety and then for botanicals as well, we always think, you know, a botanical is produced by a plant, it's not toxic, that's not too true, they can be very, very toxic. So if you're working with a botanical and you've extracted something, do some research to say, what can I find out about what kind of substances this plant would normally produce? Are there any substances in there which could be toxic? If, and if you don't know the answer to that, then again, you probably want to do an identification, a sort of um, an HPLC or, or similar, to understand what molecules you might have in there. And that's from a safety point of view. It's just like, am I okay to work with this? What precautions do I need to take? And then semiochemicals. The, in this case, you, you're working with such small, small quantities, there's rarely um, a safety issue, but you just should follow good practice about thinking about how you handle them. So just put a little bit of caution in there. Um, you know, I was working with a, a company in, in, I won't say where, I was working with a company and they had mass production of what they thought was trichoderma. And I walked into the production facility and I was thinking, yeah, there's something wrong. The smell isn't right. There's something not right. And it turns out they're producing penicillin and not trichoderma. So again, you know, they really, you really need to think about, in this case, it's not a human pathogen, but you really need to think about, are you producing the right thing? Is that quite safe? Um, anybody got any comments about that safety aspect? Is it something that people do? How did you think about this when you're starting to work um, in the lab? So any questions come through in the chat, Alison? No, not at the moment, but I think it, I mean, that, that's a critical part. And I think we've, we had sort of had that raised in, in earlier sessions as well around um, some of the botanicals that people had been working on that, that weren't really uh, safe to be working on. Um, you and, do and have just, the right PPE protection. Yeah, so. exactly. And I, uh, Cyril's just got a comment here. Before I'll be conducting a study on uh, safer compounds, first I do a uh, a survey on what synthetics are being used and frequency of applications by nearby farmers so that my study or research has stronger points. Um, so good to see that you're doing a bit of survey work uh, there, Cyril, um, going mm -hmm. forward. Um, and then here we've got a comment here. I'm not sure I'm going to say this properly, but pseudomonas, pseudomonas. Yep. Pseudomonas. Yeah. Yep. As an opportunistic human pathogen, but some bio biocontrol studies still use them. Yeah. Well, that's because it's not pseudomonas per se, it's the species of the pseudomonas. So some pseudomonas species are human pathogens, but other pseudomonas species are not human pathogens. And that's a really good example where you need to identify that you're working with something that is not a human pathogen. Sorry, so yeah. there's a lot of pseudomonas that are. And I should um, say he but, did give the correct, uh, the, the Pseudomonas aerogenosis, genosis, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. You. So, yeah, so that's when you, you have to know about your strain, species and strain to know that you're working with something that is just a human, it's not a human pathogen. Because we, commercially, we don't really want to be spraying something that's a human pathogen in the field. So no, definitely not. That's why I, that's a really good example of why you have to identify what you're working with and be really thoughtful about that. 
Yeah, yeah, great, great example. Thank you for that uh, from Good. from the group. Okay. Good. So, okay, that, that, that's that's the aspects about safety testing. So, okay, with the market assessment, product development, acquisition, and assess safety. Now we're going to on the lab screen, which is probably where, so we talked already in saying that usually this happens as this very linear way. And I'm just going to try and give some hints as how to make the time go faster. So I've already sort of said before you even start doing any work, just think about what you're doing, think about the questions you're asking, and then design experiments to answer those questions. So what we need to think about when we're starting to do this experimental work is that it, we're working in a very complex system. So um, as was just raised, that you can have um, bacteria, you have a wide range of bacteria and fungi in the roots of plants, on the plants, around the plants, the plants have got all these multiple interactions going on. So when I'm asking that question, when I'm thinking through what is the question I'm trying to ask, what's the context in which I'm asking that question? And also sort of understanding that there could be multiple interactions going in on the plant and around the plant and the biocontrols are interacting with all of these. Um, so you could be doing things which are um, alarm, um, encouraging alarm pheromones. You could be stimulating new photosynthesis chemical pathways um, or plant defense me mechanisms, you're inducing shoots and roots. It's just stopping at the beginning, just thinking all of this through as to what some of those likely effects could be, and then say, oh, how, which are the most important I need to investigate, and then how do I investigate them? But we also, it's a set, that's for the microbes, then the botanicals, it equally have multiple modes of action. We need to, again, sort of understand and think through what could happen when you're working with the substance, and therefore, depending on what could happen, what you then investigate. And then the same for semi-chemicals. You've got so many multiple modes of action. It's thinking about how am I going to work with that semi-chemical? What's the best way to work with it? What am I trying to do? So again, it's just really encouraging you to pause, think everything through before you start doing experimental work. And then just to make our life a little bit more complicated, there's this, all this beautiful research that's beginning to come through come through. So here's an example where um, somebody just asked a really simple question where they were applying, um, wanted to know what happened when you've got the insect in the plant and the biocontrol agent and looked at that interaction and realized that if the insect ate the plant, then the plant sent a signal to call it, get an entomopathogenic nematode to come and kill the insect. So you sit and think about it and think, oh, how do I design an experiment to do that? And you have to sort of just then try and think through that that's what could be happening. It might not be that you're trying to work on something that just directly kills the insect, but you might be working on something which changes the, or uplifts the processes in the plant that helps the plant defend against the insect. And so the experiment you do for that is gonna be slightly very different. And then we can think of this work where they, it's a beautiful piece of work where they put um, trichoderma, which we know is usually, atroviridae is used to control um, or manage diseases. When they put this on the seeds of maize, what it then did was send a signal out to the natural enemy to come and kill the spodoctra, the fall army worm. And that's not all we expect trichoderma to do. So again, it's experimentally thinking through what could happen, what may happen, and designing the experiment really well to investigate what's happening. What, this is where I said, this is where you could start to work on something really interesting. Instead of taking a, um, finding a new isolate trichoderma, what happens if you say take a commercial isolate, commercially available isolate trichoderma, and start to explore all the things that this trichoderma can do. And you start to unlock and open up this new area of research, and there's some really lovely discoveries to do. And then this is another sort of example of a project where um, these researchers, they found out that wheat was secreting a compound, um, a pheromone, which attracted the lace wings and the lace wings came and ate the aphids and controlled the aphids. So again, it's thinking about what we expect that pheromone to do and how we could use the pheromone and then how to investigate all of those effects. So this sort of backs up what I was trying to say about maybe not going out and finding your own isolate unless you absolutely have to have no choice, but it's thinking not just about killing your pest and disease, it's about thinking how you can work with the plant and manage the plant to um, make the plant work with the farmer to help defend itself against pests and diseases. And this is where you've got some really beautiful and interesting research, and this is what I think is 
the exciting part of research now that's coming with biocontrol, where there's groups of researchers beginning to do this kind of work where they're underpinning on how things work and looking at the full interactions and the multiple modes of actions that are going on. So having done all your sitting with a piece of paper, working with the lab, doing your research, looking at the literature, finding out what the farmers are doing, now you get to do some experiments and you've thought it through. You think, I know what the question I want to ask. I really, how am I going to, how am I going to design an experiment to do this? This is now the bit that's really exciting. Um, so what I see often happening is people do petri dish screens and they do really complicated petri dish screens. But in truth, for a biocontrol, a petri dish screen is really only useful for telling you something will or will not work to some extent. Because if you're going to have an effect on the plant, there's no way as a petri dish is going to tell you what's the effect you have on the plant. So think very carefully about doing a petri dish experiment. Very easy to do. You can get really nice data, um, possibly data that you struggle to find a meaning in. But really don't overvalue petri dish screens. And again, think, do I even need to do a petri dish screen? Thinking about that linear system, can I actually just remove that part of the step? Can I take that out and could I move on to small plot test? Because I want to see what my biocontrol agent does in terms of how it interacts with the plant and all the other things that are going on in the plant. So if I've got a substance, say, say a botanical, that I think might be active against diseases, then I might do a petri dish screen where I'll just do um, a, a, put, a, put an amount of botanical and my microorganisms and see if I get a zones of exclusion. But that's just a very, very simple, fast screen right at the beginning. And there's only specific circumstances where I'll, where I'll use that. Mostly, I miss that step out and I go straight onto the small plot test, plot test. And that can save you six months research, just taking it out. And because microorganisms, um, botanicals, and even pheromones are a little bit more complicated, I really would encourage you to start working with plants and on plants as soon as possible because you need to try and understand the context of that interaction between the plant your pest or disease and the biocontrol agent all together um, and the trick then is to design those small pot experiments that are done in a way that gives you good re reproducible data that you can design experiments well um, that are not taking too long to set up. So this is where I kind of think about miniature and scaling things down. Um, um, and if, if you're really lucky and you've got, a, say, a controlled temperature room, you can use that, but you don't need to have that. Sometimes it's, it's, it's you, about monitoring the parameters, monitoring your temperatures, monitoring the conditions that you have to work in rather than controlling them. Going back to what I said at the beginning, what you're trying to do here is maybe the question you're asking is, what stops this substance working? Is it a high temperature? Is it desiccation? So, or is it the size of the population or is it the rate of the population growth? And you can answer all of these questions by doing these small pot tests. And these are linked then to these small scale tests. If once you've done that and you've removed and understand some of your variables that are influencing the system, then you just go a little bit bigger. And this is what I could sort of think of as mini plots and small plots. So maybe not in a pot anymore, but you're maybe in the field, but with little mini plots, not big plots. And then if you um, listen to some um, other talks we've given and, and think about what I said last week about how you design those mini plots so that you I kind of do an experiment and then I monitor so much it so much so that I can get as much information out of it as I can whilst I'm running it because it's so much effort to do that small scale work that you just need to monitor and find everything you can out about it. So if you do this, you can take, uh, moving into parts, you can take at least six months, sometimes a year out of your research project. And that gives you much more time to start to get some really good data and ask some really good questions. Um, so what I do commercially is I miss some of those early steps. Um, and the only reason way I can do that is because I've taken time to research and understand what I'm working with, um, the plant, the disease, um, and I understand the questions I'm trying to ask. I'm just gonna pause a little bit um, because I suspect I've said things that people will disagree with. Um, and just see, Alison, have we got anyone get 
going, no, that's rubbish. So if you think what I've just said is completely rubbish, don't know what I'm talking about, just put up a, that smiley face going, yeah, that's never going to happen. <laughs> I'm not sure you're going to get that, Roma. I mean, it sounded like <laughs> common sense to me, but I think the idea of having a really good foundation to start with, understanding what you're trying to do and, and getting as much information first, and the idea to be able to speed up some of these later stages, yeah. but still collect as much data as you can so you're really organised. I mean, yeah. that just sounds like good common sense, and but, and, and but really targeted, you know, being really strategic around what you're doing. Um, and I guess you learn a lot of that. I mean, obviously, you're speeding up the process here by telling us lots of hints, but I guess you've learned this the hard way. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> the, yeah. yeah I'm realizing I've way. just wasted six months, really, where if I'd thought about it or if I knew what I knew now, I could have done yeah. that lot be a lot better or a different well, way. Yeah, I had a professor who said to me, he said, right, you've got to go and do a Petri dish screen. So I went and did a Petri dish screen without really thinking about it. And it's only got to the end of it and think, why did I do that? And I just realised. And so sometimes it's kind of the research, the other researchers around you and they're telling you this is what you should do. Um, so I just say, be courageous, think a little bit for yourselves and think, actually, that doesn't make sense to me. And really sort of think about it. Excellent. So is there anything in the chat? Yeah, there's a Can few comments here. Comments? One is, um, and I guess this is around when you're starting to understand and understand to test the effects on plants uh, mm -hmm. to see see all the effects. Here is, um, what about the effect on non-target organisms? Do they need to be tested also? Yeah, so that's that's a regulatory question. You absolutely have to think about that in those terms. So yes, you might. Well, that might be the question that you're asking in the experiment is, is sort of saying, um, I believe this kills this um, insect, which is a pest, but I also know there's a related insect that isn't a pest. Um, am I going to kill that as well? Absolutely, an experiment to do. And that's an example of where, say for a company, um, it'd be really useful to do that. The difficulty with that, that is it's really hard to get those insects that are the naturally occurring non-target because very few people culture them and they, it's very hard to collect them. Yeah. So it's really actually quite hard to do those experiments. But if you think you can culture them or you think you can um, find a way to do that experiment in the field, which is assesses them, then yes, um, to, to think about that. But there's some, it depends for some sort of uh, biocontrol agents or some, some biopesticides, you, you know, you, you don't need to do that kind of thing. So, so you know, um, because of the specificity of the relationship. So again, it's looking at the research and say, oh, this organism is really specialist. And the only thing it will kill is a lepidopteran. So I don't need to test my beetles. I don't need to test my dipterans. Yep. And, and there's a there's another comment here. And I, I think you sort of addressed this quite well already around just getting out there as well, out of the laboratory, escaping, <laughs> letting mm -hmm. yourself out and actually trying it in the in the real environment there with the small scale tests and pot tests. And it was just a comment here from, um, I, I think even in the laboratory tests, we're often taught to reduce factors and control most of the things, but in this research of biocontrol agents, maybe we should, in, should introduce abiotic factors and mimic the locality of um, abiotic factors. And therefore we could increase the success in field trials. I'm wondering though, whether it's actually getting out and doing those, getting out of the laboratory in the first place and not maybe trying to mimic everything, but doing the, the, the small yeah. pot trials might be the best approach. Yeah, completely. And I think it's it's hard it, because it's complicated. Um, and that's why I sort of said that sometimes what you're trying to manage is you manage the extremes, you manage the temperature, the high temperatures or the drying out or the high humidities, because you're just trying to sort of say, okay, I know it works in these conditions, and that's a way to to take the complexity out of the experimental design and experiment that you're choosing um, and it's been thinking through about what you want to so you know if I'm doing experiment I, I ask a, one really simple question and I wouldn't so if I was doing a dose rate experiment I'd only have three doses in there I wouldn't have more than that and I'd have those a long way apart from each other so it's like my strings are really low dose a really high dose and something in the middle mm -hmm. because if that works like the lower and the higher don't work then you think okay that's my extremes. Now I can start to move towards the middle in the next experiment. Yep. And it's taking that approach. 
Yep. No, no. And that's good. And let's leave, let's leave it on that simple, that last simple piece of advice, because that's a great one. Um, and let's move on because we've got a, we've got yep, quite a okay. bit, I think, may, maybe, we, we, but we're um, also tight on time. Um, no, no, really. I know, I know, oh, I know you've got it perfectly. <laughs> no, no, I know. But um, it's just, it's, yeah, it's yeah. full of information as per normal. So thanks, yeah. Roman. It's great. Yeah. Okay, so hopefully I, I've, I've persuaded you to go much faster in your laboratory screens and the, um, what you're doing. So what we're now um, thinking is um, we've covered all this first part and what notice that dotted line, maybe your decision at that point is, oh, this is just not working, stop. So always think about whether, you should, whether actually you've gone down the wrong path and you need to stop. So if you haven't, you need to then think about production. So really, really obvious this one is if your active substance can't be mass produced or made available you can't do any research because you've got nothing to work with and sometimes we forget that um, we spend ages trying to grow something and then sort of say oh, if I culture it just right or if I look after it carefully or if I've got a botanical and I extract it in a different way then I'll get something um, but you can spend a long time just trying to get enough of something to run an experiment but there's this kind of an answer in there. If it's so hard to culture and it's so hard to extract, maybe it's never going to be commercially viable. And it's, I've just got a smiley face because I've done some experiments and I've sort of got to the end and thought, ah, oh, yeah, if I can't grow this, I can never grow it commercially. So what am I doing working with this? So it's just a something to think about. So again, just think about production ability. So what's it I can sometimes see, unless you're doing a specific piece of research on how to produce something, and you're doing more general piece of research, don't spend too long on production ability. Check that they can be cultured, but then kind of stop because commercial companies have their own production methods and they will just want to adopt those production methods. So when you're thinking about production ability, you're just doing it, can it be produced easily? Is what you're answering. You're not. Don't spend time exploring under the conditions in which it is better produced, unless you're doing a specific project on that. Don't get distracted by spending time on production because a commercial company will come along and they'll check does it work in their commercial production systems anyway. So you don't need to do that. You just need to say, yeah, you can produce it easily. Um, think about that. And then for the botanicals, it's the same idea. Is just have actually a really simple method for extracting them. You don't have to have the best method. It doesn't have to be perfect because again, if a commercial company is interested in what you have, they will help either you to do that work later and fund it, or they'll bring that in-house and they'll match it to their existing systems because they have so much knowledge on that if you found the right commercial partner. So don't, again, you're just confirming in principle that it can work, but you're not spending too much time looking at the exact temperatures, the conditions, the methodology, etc. Just say, in principle, you can culture it. And um, in senior chemicals, it's very unlikely that a lab is able to produce it, unless you're a chemist. Um, and then so you need to see, can you find a small specialist company to make small amounts for you? Um, and there are companies out there that will do that, um, rather than you trying to produce it yourself. So just again, think about this carefully. Don't get distracted and spend a lot of time on production unless you're working on projects specifically on production. So that's production. I'm going to move on then to um, formulation now. So um, again, I've seen a lot of research projects where the, the um, research scientists have come to me and said I've, they've spent a lot of time on formulation. Um, so the first principle is for most biocontrols, you should be working with substances for formulation that don't have a higher toxicity classification in the active substance because the whole world wants substances now that have less toxicity so it'd be crazy to co-formulate with something that's more toxic than your active substance just a sort of strong piece of advice and my advice here for formulation is like product production um, when we think about formulation we've got two aspects there's formulation for shelf life and formulation in field persistence so unless again you're doing a research project specifically on formulation, you need to not spend much time on this. And I see again, research projects, which are spending like 50% of their time developing a formulation, which I know the commercial company will completely ignore because it's no use to them. It's only if you've got a specific issue uh, that you're solving and your research is about formulation, would you really be doing this? Again, you're going for something simple. So most microorganisms are formulated in simple, a simple oil, like a, 
um, soy oil or oil seed rape oil or olive oil or something very, very simple, or they're formulated in something dry like um, uh, kaolin, so an aluminum silicate or something like that. And the majority of microorganisms are formulated as simply as that. Um, so sometimes you have to add something like a kaolin just to stop the spores sticking together. And it's as simple as that. I've got formulations which are water. So really, again, don't get distracted and think that commercial companies want you to, to do this before they'd be interested in your active substance. No, if you've got something that's really good, that's working really well, this is a part that they'll pick up on or they'll come back to you and say, I'd like you now to do some research on the formulation. They'll have specific parameters. And it's the same for the botanicals. The same idea is don't spend a lot of time working for machine. Formulate it enough so that you can work with it and prove that it's working really well unless you're doing a particular project on formulation. And then the same with semi chemicals. Unless you do a particular project on this and you're a specialist in this, you know, this is what the specialist should be doing. So that's what I've covered, we're, we're covered now. So we've worked our way through, we've done market assessment, acquisition, safety, reduction ability. We've looked at the small pop test and I've said how you can move from here to, to this point much quicker. You can miss out some of the steps in here. I've said, think about scale up, check that it can scale up, but don't do any more. And then I've sort of talked a little bit about formulation and saying, don't spend a lot of time formulation unless you're doing formulation market. So somebody raised this um, earlier then about regulation as well and thinking about um, regulations. So if you're doing a research project, a bit that I don't see done, if you see this orange bar running down the side, commercially, I will start thinking about registration right at the beginning. What am I doing then? So the first thing I'm doing is I need to consider the registrability of the active substance. What do I mean by that? So I want to find out if this substance, so if it's a human pathogen, you cannot register it. If it is, has got a high level of toxicity, you're unlikely to register it. But what more importantly, that's not what the market is looking for anymore. The market is looking for substances which don't have high levels of toxicity. Um, so you need to just think about what you've got and what its safety profile would be and what its positioning in the market because the market is looking for things that aren't highly toxic anymore. Um, and you're looking for what I call red flags. So if you've got a botanical, have you got something in that botanical mix which will cause toxicity? And if you have, can you change your botanical extraction process to remove that? And so you need to just go through and think about the registrability of something. And it's a, this is a kind of a good checklist to just sit and think through. So the identity and specifications, like have I got a human, human pathogen? Um, Physchem properties, this would be a botanical sort of, what is it, what does it, look like how difficult it's going to be work with is it highly volatile if it's highly volatile what does that mean in terms of uh, registration what could the issues be and you slowly just use this checklist and think through do i have a substance that will be possible to register and if you're interested we've run a series on registration to give you a bit more detail about it but it's i always ask myself that this at the beginning is is this registrable? So essentially, the more toxic something is, the more expensive it is to register. So on average, it takes around half, half to two million to register a biocontrol agent without any toxicity. If it has toxicity, that can get up to five, 10, 20 million. So again, in looking at thinking about a commercial company, will a commercial company invest in it? If it's got those high levels of toxicity, will they can they afford to make that extra cost? Um, and if they did, it would have to have a big market. This would have to be a product which could be used on a major, major crop and a major, major pest. And they'll sort of get big global sales from it. Otherwise, they can't invest in it. So, again, when you're looking at your active substances, as well as your own safety, think about it in terms of safety for the regulation process at the end of it. And then... Um, we're down at the bottom, all of this is done. I'm pretty certain I've got something that's really good. I'm pretty certain I know that it can be produced. I'm pretty certain that actually it'll probably formulate it. It's not just going to die within a day. It'll, it's possible to keep it going. And I've done some large plot trials. And then this is what we talked about last week um, was the efficacy. We started at the end and we went through in detail about 
efficacy and how we assess efficacy. And this is something that um, people are often surprised that it sits so far at the end of this process, but hopefully you can make all those other steps go really fast by thinking through carefully all the elements before you even get to this, this point. Um, and this is just summarizing up what's good practice to get good efficacy. And this, some of this good practice can also apply to those early pop tests, et cetera, that I was talking about. So I'm just going to take a little bit of a pause there, Alison, um, to see whether there's any questions or comments coming through. Not at this point, but I've got a couple of questions. Um, you said, mm. I mean, you, you've got these dotted lines and you're saying that it's good to know that you should stop maybe. And, and I'm sure there's some very rigorous discussions within, um, you know, companies sometimes with people arguing whether they should stop or not. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I'm sure that's very rigorous. Um, but do you think it is it easy for researchers to stop in your experience? I'm just wondering, it, it, we, we all sort of, once we think we'd like to do something, it's quite hard to stop sometimes. Do, yeah, do you find that it it's really difficult? Like researchers keep trying to push through and push through and try and get to the end? Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I raise it. I think it's one of the most valuable things you can do as a researcher is to really ask. Do I need to stop this project or do I need to stop this line of inquiry? Because sometimes you put so much effort into it, you just think, oh, no, I want it to work. And you try again and again. And sometimes mm -hmm. there's merit in that. But a lot sometimes I think the question we should ask ourselves is actually, do I just need to stop this line of research? Do I need to stop doing this because yeah. it's not going to be successful? I've gone down a, a, the wrong direction. And it's a it's hard. It's a very bold discussion. Uh, decision to make but if you've got a good plan that I described at the, bit, at the beginning you can go back to that plan and say okay this is where I started and this is the questions I've asked I was asking where am I on that plan and mm -hmm. and you revisit that plan and you think about it and it's yeah I mean I've worked on projects where we've you know it's something I've really believed in I thought it's really great I've done great work and the company says no nah, we we just don't see there's gonna be a big enough market for it or it's it's not stable we can't produce it well enough or we've tried formulating it and it, we can't keep it alive and then your project has to start stop it's and I tough. guess it's a, really I guess tough. that's a serious point too I mean as in it may be a good product and it may be a good idea but if it if you can't actually get it out there and farmers can use it at scale then then it doesn't really yeah. matter it's a nice to do but maybe not a need to do um yeah. but but interesting here i think ruth just said if you do stop you should publish i think she's meaning the question yeah. is sometimes we often don't hear about people's failures <laughs> <laughs> There's some really yeah, good absolutely. learning opportunities from when yeah, we do yeah. stop. Is it, it do, do we see many of those sort of published papers of like, actually, why, why this didn't go right? Or no. <laughs> Science is really bad at publishing when it didn't go wrong. Because when it goes wrong, we think we got something wrong. But when if you've thought about it well, if you designed your experiment well and it goes wrong, it's telling you something about that microorganism. And that what it's telling you is really useful information. So absolutely share that, publish it. And I think that's what I was try, trying to say is the fact you hit, re, reach a dead end doesn't mean that you didn't do good research and it doesn't mean that you didn't get a good result. It may be we go into this and we have preconceptions about we don't actually ask open questions. Mm. We have go in and think, I think this microorganism will kill this insect. You know, I'm, I'm building everything on the assumption that it doesn't. And then it doesn't kill the insect. And you think, oh, what did I do wrong? But maybe not. Maybe that microorganism is never going to kill that insect. And publishing that information is really, really useful. Mm. And this, but if you haven't thought through it all, you can't publish because your sort of null hypothesis and your concept isn't well enough established to know that that, what, that information sits against. So it's that's why I'm saying it's really you need to really carefully plan so when you get those negative results that you can still publish those negative results. So it's not about having no data. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It. it would be mm. a good maybe mm. a good um, journal, uh, you know, a special edition would be failures. I think <laughs> <laughs> that, might, that might encourage um, some papers. 
<laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, only failures can be published in this in this special edition, which would be quite interesting. Um, you had another question: Can it be produced? Um, and and you were looking at mm -hmm. that and saying, don't spend too much time on that, as in just get a can it be produced or not, and then the company might um, will have its own processes and probably specialists at that. But um, I guess just that basic information around can it be produced or not? Um, mm -hmm. Can is it a good idea sometimes if you don't know to talk to the companies? and just sort of say in your experience or what's your do you think this could be i mean is that useful yeah yeah, yeah of course it, of course it is it's, it's like anything we're doing in science it's we're all much stronger if we talk to other people who know about this and yeah. we exchange our ideas between them so absolutely and it may be the company or it may be a, a fellow researcher but it makes it's somebody who who really knows that microorganism and they may be able to say oh yeah you've got to give it this ph or it actually needs this micronutrient or something like that and it's just small clues like that so research always talk to other people and learn from each other share that knowledge as much as possible really good plan yeah. excellent great thanks Rama. okay good okay um so yep so i've talked about efficacy um and i'd encourage you to go uh to to re-listen to what we talked about last week about how to do that and apply some of those principles to what we were talking about was field efficacy but you can apply those principles to those small plot experiments and think about your experimental design talk to your um, uh, statisticians um, and design really good experiments and and so often we jump into the field and assess efficacy without pausing to think so just in the same way with those small plot experiments, you took a moment to think about the questions you were really asking, and then you designed the simplest experiment. If you aim to design the simplest experiment you can, you stand a better chance of getting da data. Ask one question in each experiment. Don't ask 10 questions, because when you have variance levels of 50% and you ask lots of questions, you'll end up not answering any of the questions. You've just got noisy data. But if you ask one question, you stand a much higher chance of answering that question. So if you can do those small, targeted, fast experiments, answering one question, you're better doing several of those than trying to do one experiment with everything in it. I've so often seen those big experiments with 10 treatments, with multiple questions, or not even being clear, clear about questions, and more will you end up with, with really noisy data, and none of which you can understand, and then you're trying to publish something, saying, I sort of think I saw this, but I wasn't sure, and I couldn't find out. So again, just um, being really thoughtful to design those field experiments. Um, and just to think about this, you know, when I'm working with a company, and we are looking to, to launch a product, product um, the number of field trials we'll do that I need to do to understand if that product really works. I've never done less than 10. I'm usually doing 20 or 30. So it's just sort of saying, actually, should I spend my time and effort and do those big efficacy things at the end? Or could I do some work which finds out more about the um, characteristics and parameters and dose effect and the effect between dose um, and um, insect? That are more important than actually moving on that step of that big, big field trial. That said, I do know commercial companies are really bad and saying, "Well, have you done a trial? Have you proved it's work? Well, it's worked." But if you've done that project plan and that really good think through and that very thoughtful experiments, you'll have a lot of data which helps the company to decide if this is something that they want to work with you on and they want to potentially invest in. So just to recap, we've been through all of the, 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 these aspects and I, hopefully what's come through um, as a thread is, and it's something I do, and this saves me so much time and effort, is to, I stop and I think and I consult with people and I gather lots of knowledge before I even do an experimental piece. And that has helped me. It took a long time to learn it. I made lots of mistakes, but that really helped me to make each experiment I do a better experiment, asking a better question, and I get far, far less failures um, by taking this approach than I, than I used to do. And it allows you to take that three years worth of money or six years worth of money and those resources and get the results that you can really work with. So that's where I was going to get, get to um, in terms of sort of thinking through that um, product development process. And I thought about this product development process today as a researcher, 
in the next session, I'll reflect more on it as that product development process of what you're doing in that commercial situation, a little bit more about how a company thinks about it and how a company um, will move forward. So um, Alison spoke at the beginning about some of the questions that we that she asked in advance. And Alison, do you want to pick up for this slide? Yeah, just quickly, but I think um, you, you, you've pretty much got it. <laughs> you can take over, Roma. But but yeah, we asked this question as part of the survey. And thank you so much. And I, I didn't even put up all the answers, actually. I just uh, couldn't fit everything in the slide. But we got some really good feedback. And I thought it was really interesting. So I've put them up here. And I guess, um, Roma, it's really interesting um, to see what you think of some of these responses. Yeah. I, I guess it's not a surprise that funding finance is, is, is one of the ones that pops up quite a bit. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. You know, if, if, if we're working in research, we've always got lots of ideas. We have far more ideas than there is ever money to, to do the research on the ideas. And hopefully, as I've gone through today, I've sort of given these some indications of, of, of how to make those resources go really well. Um, so um, financial support was quite a lot of the feedback, completely understand that. Um, and I, there's a lovely, oh, sorry, there's a lovely comment. There's how to start involving farmers to test products and get permits. So that's that's a little bit more of what we're going to talk about the next time. Um, I, I said, but as researchers, right from the beginning, start talking to farmers, finding out what farmers are doing. As I said, they're a really great source of knowledge and farmers really love learning as well. So it's the beginning, but then um, when you're getting to, to the end, for farmers testing the product at the end, that's actually when you've been through a lot of the other steps. It means you, you've got an active substance that you want. It means you know that you can mass produce it. It knows that you can formulate it. So this is something right, right at the far end. This is in terms of starting to market in a way. Um, then there's a question in the purple, so to formulate and increase the storage capacity of the product. Again, this is much more of a, a commercial question. As researchers, your first aim is to say, can it be produced easily? And can I just have some reasonable storage? You know, if it's gonna die in the next day, no one's gonna work with it because you haven't got anything to work with. So you answer those questions. Then that part about how to formulate um, and improve um, shelf life or storage capacity is something that I'll pick up a little bit more further on. Um, so then you've got question, uh, comments on saying that would look like um, help on res registration procedures and to monetize funds that once the research is over is how do you pay for registration? Um, and that is that is a universal problem is how do you pay for registration? But what I would say is if you've come up with a technology that is really good, um, that's the point at which you then need to step out and, and bring in um, investment and bring in commercial money. And if you've got something that's good and you've done the, the research and you have the evidence to show that you've got something that's good and you can show that this is something that the marketplace needs, it's going to be much easier to get the money for registration because as a general rule, governments don't support registration. That's very much a commercial company procedure. And I think in, and if I think of all the projects I've worked on, I've only can think of one example and I mean yeah I've worked on lots I can think of one example where this was funded by the research institute for registration in all the other cases the registration was funded by a commercial partner but what you can do is you can do some good fundamental research which underpins the information that's needed for the registration process so you can do some work that is really clear about the identity so you can identify something, uh, compare it to phylogenetic tree and really identify it well, if it's a microorganism or if it's a botanical, you really look at the chemical structure um, of the composition. Uh, you can also um, understand the, fit, the fizz chem properties in terms of a botanical or in terms of a microorganism, you understand things like dose. You understand a lot of information about um, the way in which the mode of action, you understand the temperature growth profile of your microorganism, you understand the pH tolerance of, of your, your, your botanical. All this information done really well underpins a dossier and actually makes a dossier much, much cheaper. So again, by planning the work that's done well and thoughtfully, you're providing that fundamental information that helps to support a dossier. Um, 
the advice on mass production again i'll touch on that in the next in the next session about um mass production but again I think, as I've indicated today, mass production is something that a specialist company really needs to do. And unless you're planning to become that specialist company, I would advise working with partner to do that. OK, so, um, Alison, that was sort of where I would pause today. I will just open it up to the floor to um, ask any questions. Um, and what I particularly, perhaps before we get on to that, what I want to say is, in the next session, we'll look at this more from a commercial point of view, from a, from a research point of view. But also, the next session is going to be a masterclass in the wider sense, in the sense that we're going to have a question and answer session. So what I'd really like to do in this next session is if people can send me um, the questions that they have, um, and Alison will explain how the process for doing that. And what we'll do is we'll go through in detail specific examples that people have on specific projects um, and we'll take all those ideas together so um, Alison do you want to explain what how we want to collect that those questions yeah sure I have a um, couple of questions um, as well but I will just say to okay. everyone we are going to send a um, survey out like we sent out yesterday and in that survey I will leave space for uh, if you have you know some questions that you wanted to ask an expert about any of the sessions sessions one two and three the commercialization that we'll be talking about next week what would you ask or what would you like to ask and we'd like you to put the, those questions in and we'll collect them all together and really have a session now it would be great if you could ask them as well in the session but if you're a bit shy and, and you just want to put the questions down sometimes um we can ask them and we'll get roma to actually really um really sort of think about those over the week coming and um, we'll come back and really have a good brainstorm session so really please try and do the survey and give us some questions because that's where we find out what you haven't understood or what you want more support on or, or something that we've missed or um, this is the really rich experience and, and opportunity that you have so please take advantage of it uh, and answer, you can ask any question Roma will either say that she uh, knows lots about it <laughs> or that she doesn't know know anything about it uh, and we may have somebody from um we may have somebody from uh the, the private sector as well from the from a company to actually come in and just give their view around some of these questions as well around um what roman said today the things that like, come and ask us sometimes or maybe you could work on something that we're interested in or have developed it would be great to have those sorts of partnerships we'll, we'll get somebody in to maybe talk about that too just to show you that roma really knows what she's talking about which which we know we know anyway but Roma, I've got a question because not mm. every country or not every region or not every city or wherever researchers are working in, in lots of universities across the regions of this world, not all of them have well-developed research laboratories. Mm. And I see a question here. I've seen lots of different quality of laboratories from super duper amazing, you know, million, multi-million dollar type things to sort of very small basic type of research laboratories. But how, I mean, how important is that? I mean, can, I mean, you're talking about trials out there in the field as well and pot trials mm -hmm. and stuff. How, how important is that? I mean, can, you can still go, do good research um without the the multi-million dollar laboratory is that true or give us some yeah, hope yeah. here <laughs> yeah yeah no absolutely it is um what i think is that the key to research isn't the really fancy equipment especially in biocontrol really nice equipment can help with some parts but what really really helps is the thinking at the beginning so when i had to do my phd i had virtually no money at all in fact, other, the other labs used to take pity on me and used to give me their pipettes and things like that. Once they've used, they used pipettes and they gave me their the used equipment. The only thing I had was a lovely microscope. Um, so I, that's kind of how I, it was good for me because that's how I learned. I learned how to sit down and think and how I used my resources really carefully because I didn't have quick equipment. I didn't have temperature control rooms. I didn't have greenhouses. I didn't, I had to grow the plants myself. Um, I had to think about how to, to get hold of my um, seeds. And so what I did was I, I spoke to other lab, labs lots. I went to go um, collaborate with labs. I learned from colleagues as much as possible in other facilities. But for me, 
being good at research is about your thinking and your processes, not necessarily about the equipment you have. Now, of course, it's great if you've got a really good microscope. It's great if you've got um, a very good uh, HPLC, for example, if you're trying to find a botanical. But I kind of worked on a rough and ready bench that I just used to have to scrub down and keep clean every time I wanted to do some microbiological work. I didn't have a flow cabinet to work with. Uh, I used to have to pour my plates really carefully. I just had a pressure cooker to, to autoclave my plate, my agars and pour my plates. So you can absolutely do it. It's about having thinking through and having processes um, that think through. And I, I actually think I was a better researcher because I didn't have the money. And so I, couldn't afford to make as many mistakes because I didn't have the money to make mistakes but I had the equipment so yeah it's not about money it's about process and thinking excellent no I think that's really good advice because I mean I know that the not not everyone has access to uh, the the most recent or mo the most uh, you know expensive equipment or uh, and some of us some people are very lucky and they do um, but mm. I think a lot of this research is as you say around really um, being a good researcher, having a good process in place, and 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 being creative uh, as well, yeah. and and so I think that's I think that's um, excellent um, thought, feedback there. Um, and here's we've just got some feedback from Lorena here saying thanks for the insight. It's not about the money, uh, but the thinking process and creativity. Oh, I yeah. took yeah, words perfect. out of my mouth. <laughs> that was perfect. I agree. No, no, that's very important. Um, so we've got a big week next week. Uh, it's same time, uh, Wednesday, 22nd of June uh, at 1500 uh, Singapore time. And we would really like to see you back. We'll definitely have quite an interactive session next week. We're going to send the survey around. We'd really like your feedback. Definitely, we want a big list of questions. Um, and we're really wanting a lot of, um, that we can even unmute people, people can talk. We'll have somebody from the industry come in and just give us a quick kind of a few views of them so that you know that they're not scary people as well, that they're actually wanting to hear from you. Uh, it's a two way process. Um, and uh, that should be very good. So look, thank you for joining us. I just want to, um, I've got a comment here from JL Tan and thank you so much for your comments and, and your questions, et cetera, right through the chat. Uh, really appreciated those. And it says passion for the research will be able to drive you to innovate even when there is no budget and facilities. So yeah, I, I think that's a great, place to end it. I'd like to um, thank again Valent Biosciences and Sumitomo Chemical for supporting this series and, and thank you so much for that. Uh, really great um, to really have that passion as well to actually helping people in the region um, and our research, um, our, all our research colleagues around uh, Southeast Asia but actually across the world. Um, you've got lots of thank yous uh, there in the chat, Roma. Thank you to you again. It's such an uh, intense session and, and I know how much uh, work you're putting into it and just drawing on that experience that you've gathered over the years is really important and sharing that with us. So thank you. And thank you, Putra, for uh, helping out as well. Uh, we'll be back next week. Keep safe, everyone. And I'm just going to turn on my videos just so that I, I forgot to turn it on, but I just wanted to say um, I can't see myself because I haven't got the thing on, but I wanted to just show my face again and, and say keep safe and we're looking forward to seeing you next week so um we'll be back on wednesday thank you very much thank you hi awesome great and i'm just gonna end the recording